So I'm just like, what do you mean you're not going to give him his royalties? Like, oh, look, if you're not going to reinstate the music, if you're not going to give him access to his account, if you're, you know, that's your call as a private company. You can do that. But I go, you can't just keep the royalties. And I, you know, cite it to law and it's conversion, which is, you know, the, the civil claim for like stealing. Like it's conversion. You can't just take someone's money. They're like, no, 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 we're not going to release his funds. What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Cord. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us anywhere that you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. Big emphasis on currency today because y'all know when we do this intro, we have a very special guest with us. Today we have an attorney, a, a lawyer. I'm never good with the specific terms. Like somebody who really knows this legal stuff, though, that we don't know. This is not our expertise, which is why I'm super excited because <laughs> we're going to get game in a different way today because Miss Crystal is with us today, blessing us with our presence. Miss Crystal, how are you doing? Appreciate you. I'm, I'm good. I don't bless people with my presence very often. I'm certainly not when it comes to TuneCore. They would not say I'm blessing them with anything, but uh, very happy to be here. Oh, man. Well, you, you, you kind of got straight to it. Um, <laughs> uh, we have some really important stuff to get into because you are helping artists in a real way when it comes to Tomb Court um, and the, the case that you're working on. So like we said, we use the term lawyer, like you're doing real time, real world work We uh, on stuff that we talk about on podcasts, give our opinions on it. But that doesn't mean anything's going to necessarily happen. You know what I mean? We want stuff to happen, right? We feel like we make an impact on changing the world and the ideas, but like this is on paper. Um, so artists, please listen and managers, everybody. Definitely. Um, I want y'all to follow this conversation. There's going to be some really important stuff, but um, Miss Crystal, if you could please kind of just summarize the work you're doing, the case that you're working against Tune Court right now. Yeah, you got it. And this was a this was a very unique opportunity in that I don't get to talk about my cases very often, right? Because I've attorney client privilege. Anyone that hires me, I'm a real attorney, right? I've been doing this over nine years. And in this particular case, it just got so frustrating that my client and I were having a conversation and uh, you know, he said I had his permission to chat about it. And I've, you know, still redacted some stuff that we've been showing because I'm very like factual about this in when I came to my platform on YouTube and I just was like, guys, this is what's been going on. And I took the followers through everything and I showed, you know, letters, right? What actual text, case law citation, evidence, and, you know, redacted just a few things like his email and his name and things like that. But it was an, it was an opportunity just to uh, start the conversation. And what was amazing about it is that so many people have chimed in on this and people are just way more invested than I was expecting. But, you know, just to kind of give you a, a quick summary of this, because it's become the saga. If you go to Top Music Attorney YouTube right now, it's like everyone's chiming in. It's all about TuneCore and distributors and royalties. And so the conversation has become much bigger. But here's where it started. Where it started was our client had been locked out of his account. And I don't know if you guys have ever distributed through TuneCore, but like DistroKid is a popular one. Symphonics is, you know, CD Baby. Um, so this happens from time to time. And when there's enough money in your account as the artist, as the music producer, uh, you know, that you're like, I got blocked. I got something happened with my music. I'm out of my account. I need help. You might go and contact an attorney. I was that attorney in this case. And we've helped clients with this kind of thing, right? And so it might be, you know, there was an alleged streaming fraud. I make like sleepy time music. So my music was getting a ton of streams. I was getting paid tons of royalties. And so they flagged it. They're like, ah, it must be, you know, a you know, bakery. And so we go in and we draft, you know, a letter and we say, you can't just take an artist's royalties, right? So, you know, if we go in and, and, and fight the good fight, we usually get the royalties released. We usually get the accounts reinstated and just, you know, go through the process. The unfortunate part about all of that is that an artist had to come to me to get that help. Not everyone can do that. Right. So, so, so in this case, uh, you know, this was the first time we actually had dealt with TuneCore. So the client comes and just explains some similar kind of thing. There had been alleged streaming fraud and he had been kicked out of TuneCore, blocked, all these things. And he'd been trying to get into touch with them for several years because there was like tens of thousands of dollars in royalties here. And so he goes, you know, finally, I'm just at this point where I got to get a lawyer. So we sent the letter 
And, you know, what was kind of odd about this is that over the timeline of what happened over several months and all the communications with TuneCore is that even right out the gate, the first phone call that I had with TuneCore in response to my letter was your client has engaged in streaming fraud. We have all this evidence and he's a big fraudster and, uh, you know, we're not going to give him his royalties. And I'm on the phone, you know, with essentially the glorified bang, right? We can agree that music distributors are distributing music, collecting money, taking a portion of that money, and then paying you, okay. right? Other than that, they're not usually doing anything. So anyway, and so I'm just like, what do you mean you're not going to give him his royalties? I go, look, if you're not going to reinstate the music, if you're not going to give him access to his account, if you're, you know, that's your call as a private company, you can do that. But I go, you can't just keep the royalties. And I, you know, cite it to law and its conversion, which is, you know, under the law, it's like the, the, the civil claim for like stealing. Like it's conversion, you can't just take someone's money. So this thing continued to escalate because we just kept hitting a wall. And they're like, no, 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 we're not going to release his funds. And the, it, <laughs> the way that they would speak about our clients was very rude right out the gate. He's not a real artist. We heard his music. I'm like, what are you talking about? First of all, that's rude. Like, it's mm -hmm. not, you know, we don't really care about your opinion. But regardless, like, that has nothing to do with the law and the fact that you can't just keep someone's money. Um, you know, so setting that aside, uh, it finally came to this point where, like, I'm on the phone with TuneCore and we're being told this is an ethical issue. And TuneCore needs to, you know, plant its flag in the sand to make sure that these big fraudsters who are stealing royalties are stopped. And I go, setting aside the legal thing that you haven't actually addressed, right? So we go, under the law, you can't just take someone's royalties. It's an impermissible penalty. All these things. And then I'm like, it sounds like you're just saying this is like an ethical and moral issue, which I've never dealt with when I'm talking to a lawyer in all of my years. And uh, they actually just called him a scumbag and they were just not going to release the funds. As a final ditch effort, we go, OK, can we, if we can just prove that our artist, you know, because they were like, he's not a real artist. He doesn't make real music. I'm like, what does that even mean? I go, if we can prove he's a real artist, will you release his funds? And they came back and led us to believe that they would. So we went through this process of just, you know, what would you do if you're trying to show that someone's a legitimate artist? They release music, they have videos on YouTube, they have a fan following, you know what I mean? And uh, so we sent all that stuff. We even sent them evidence that he had paid $25,000 in Facebook ads, which, as you know, converts usually to a lot of traffic and may have resulted in, you know, the music getting flagged. Um, and all of that was just ignored. So after all of that which is expensive if you're hiring an attorney, beyond it just being incredibly frustrating. They came back and they said, nope, not gonna release the royalties. So anyway, we brought it to the, the, the platform. I kind of started the conversation and we did a final last ditch effort, which I, I read the letter on my channel and I showed that, you know, essentially we said this has become like a, big, a bigger thing. Like people are saying they want to make this a class action, which our client could. He could decide to try to get everyone involved because a lot of people are commenting i this just happened to me yesterday this just happened to me and so i go this thing is escalating this is your final attempt release the funds and if you don't we're moving forward and in fact here's a complaint so we actually hired a new york attorney and drafted the lawsuit and so we sent that so then we we did in fact received a response which was the last video that i released and it was the update on this from them and I read exactly what TuneCore said because TuneCore came back and they not only just dug in their heels, uh, but they said that they will counter sue our artist if he moves forward to try to collect his royalties and they even threatened me. So it's been, it's been quite interesting. How can they threaten you in that particular situation? Attorneys do this from time to time and they go, uh, you know, sometimes it'll just be, we think that if you bring a, a, you know, a lawsuit, it's, it's frivolous and, you know, we're going to sue you for sanctions. But in this case, I had said in my final letter, I go, <clears throat> we have, you know, we brought this to our platform and it's just received a lot of support and all this stuff. So I wanted to make them aware of the fact that there is a conversation about this becoming a class action <laughs> and it's a legitimate thing. And, and in the response, the um, TuneCore goes, 
we just became aware that you have used your platform to talk about this. I'm like, of course you became aware of it because I told you in my letter. <laughs> but in any case, they go that not only do I need to issue a retraction, of everything that I've said, but I also need to take down all of my videos. That's what I said. I go, hmm. And, and I just was like laughing about it. I'm just like, what would that even look like? I'm like, guys, you know, I showed you real evidence and real screenshots, but it turns out none of it was true. Like what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, man, this is, this is interesting because especially the timing of it, um, right? We're now in that time where Spotify made their big uh, issue with bots, right? Putting so much on, mm -hmm. on the distributors. So distributors are in droves creating situations with artists, blocking them from the platform, saying, I see all, I've seen a couple letters that they sent artists where they like to be, continue to use the platform. They say you were agreeing that you're going to pay like X amount per like song or something like that that has bots, like little, just different types of messaging where distributors are trying to figure out how do we protect ourselves in this new environment based on what Spotify just said, right? So because of that, there's been a huge um, increase in these type of situations happening that, you know, it was, they, they've happened before, but like right now it's happened. I, I mean, I've gotten a whole bunch of people um, mention this stuff to me way more than what they have in the past. Um, and not just TuneCore, like other companies as well. Um, like multiple of the other distributors. So and in terms of a class action, I'm imagining that it does still have to be tune core specific, right? Um, in terms of like you gathering other people or y'all, however that works traditionally. And then I guess like how long, what would that process look like? Because I've heard of crash action lawsuits before, um, even had gotten random letters in the mail to my mom's house saying, hey, you should, you guys should be. That's right. <laughs> I don't quite know exactly what it really looks like and means um, from a real world implication. Yeah, well, and let me clarify one thing. So part of the issue that this whole thing arose out of, and it's the biggest issue, which is it's the terms of use, right? Every time you use an app, it's always like, click here, you're saying you accept. And if you ever actually click it, it's like a giant contract. Right. And so for TuneCore's terms of service, it says, if there's a claim against you for any of these reasons, and we read it together on my channel, there's like a giant block and part of it's streaming fraud, but it could be like alleged copyright infringement, alleged trademark infringement. I mean, it's just a huge list. If there's just a claim, not that they prove it, not that it's true. If there's just a claim, they say they can forfeit your royalties. So that was the mechanism that they were saying and what they use, not just for our client, but everyone else. So that's why the everyone else piece is important here so um to your to your you know question so when you have a class action you can get it when there's under the rule it's numerosity meaning there's a lot of people right who are harmed by this thing and so if you have not only a whole lot of people but it's the same issue it's the same you know question that has to be answered by a court you can have one person that brings those claims on behalf of everyone and so you you have to get the courts okay to you know get certified as a class but you know it's the same process of you know if you needed to sue someone and you hired me like you know we're filing a complaint whether it's just you or you on behalf of other people so you know there's a step that has to, that, that you have to go through but really it's like a lawsuit in general have you have you ever been sued or sued someone um sued We've had legal oh, situations. Yeah, yeah. I've definitely been a part of legal situations, <laughs> but I don't know about not no, I'm not technically sued. No. Yeah. No. Okay. So yeah, and no, I'm like you you would answer that really fast if you had, which is yeah, because it's just like it's traumatizing for most people, whether you're like suing or being sued. It takes forever. I mean, you know, I, I always give people the speech and I'm like, look, if you want to hire me and let's sue, I mean, I'm, I'm game, but I understand that these typically take like one to three years and it's probably going to be like 50000 or $100,000. And so, you know, you should be ready to go the distance, you know, and sometimes these things settle early on, but that's really it, whether it's a class action or not. It's right. a huge investment of time and money. And for me, that's a little bit of my frustration on behalf of artists you know i'm an independent artist i have done music since i was four years old and um you know i had to i had to go through a lot of challenges it's literally the reason i went to law school 
is because I wanted to learn how to protect myself. Mm. And so then I'm like, you know, when an artist is going to go so far as to hire an attorney just to try to get their royalties. But now, because TuneCore is saying, we're not going to do anything, we're ignoring what you're saying in regards to like these penalties and this and that, that, you know, essentially the artist is now needing to sue and pay tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Let me take a quick second to say, if you're looking for a music distributor that cares about educating their artists so they can get in a better position, you should check out Two Loss because every single Monday, they have office hours where they bring on dope people in the industry to hop on calls, give artists insights on the future of the music industry and answer some of the questions they have going on in their personal careers. So if you aren't a user of Two Loss or just want to have a little bit more information about them, go to Two Lost on Instagram. That's T-O-O-L-O-S-T, Two Lost on Instagram, and it'll take you to everything you need to see, inform you about the sessions and more. Back to this episode. What do you think should happen in a situation where there are legitimate bots? Like, and it could be intentional or unintentional. I just dropped a video recently about a lot of artists um, that I've spoken to who are dealing with these bot companies well, who literally put bots on your profile as like a sales mechanism and hit you up and then say, you know, that was me, right? That wasn't an algorithm. And would you like more of this? Pay me, right? So, and then like one guy was like, he didn't want that. He asked him to take it off. And they, of course, they didn't know how to take it off. They, they just expect you to say yes or no, or you can keep moving, right? But in fact, there are real bots like now on, on its profile. Um, like, what do you think? So it's a really, I know it's a really complex conversation, but do you feel like there is a way that distributors should handle that? Yeah, I mean, I wish I wish they would do more than than just say we can't show you our proprietary methods of how we can see all this stuff. Because that was another part of our issue with TuneCore. They have not given us screenshots. They have not given us anything other than typing out words in uh, like an email and being like, this is what it was. Right. But, you know, I wish I wish, you know, there would there would be more transparency with that and an opportunity for an appeal process. You know, and I'm like. What was it with Spotify? They made thirteen billion in twenty twenty three. I think Billboard reported that their expenses were nine billion, so they were you know profitable like three point seven I think u s billion. So I'm just saying they're a big company, right? But I'm pretty sure that they don't have the staff that you would expect with like a Pepsi, for example. I think that there needs to be more people in place to actually try to help. and you know, and and stuff happens. like they're you know, someone hires a PR company. You don't know what they're doing. They need to give results. And so that PR company or that marketing company pays for fake streams to try to meet a quota to get paid. And you don't know. But all of a sudden, your music's taken down and your royalties are taken. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's cautious. But look, let me give you one practical tip, right? So if you ever need to move your music between distributors, because, you know, one good thing is that they're all pretty much the same. Uh, Just make sure your ISRC number, which you get when you distribute your music, Make sure you have that as far as your process. Like you can look it up on 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 Google. There's like third party websites that can, that can help you. As part of like whoever's listening to this, your administrative step of saving that ISRC number so that if your music gets taken down, go somewhere else. Distribute it, you know, the next day on Symphonic or CD Baby. Do you know what I'm saying? Especially if something wasn't your fault. If we need to have a fight with the, you know, the the original distributor, that's fine. That's a separate thing. But as far as just like your business making sure your music is up and that's uninterrupted. Like you can do things to self-help. That's part of it. And by the way, you know, just a reminder, like she's been chronicling this as she, as you mentioned, right. Um, for a, a while on her page. So talk music attorney, if you Google that, you will find her page and just go through the videos. And there's a lot of other dope information to help as well. Um, but just transition a conversation a little bit. That's in a, Similar, but not the same space as well. Um, there's been a, I don't know if you've seen that James Blake has dropped uh, his own like subscription platform. Have you seen that? Or do you know who James Blake is? What's, what, what's the name of the platform? It's called like Bot, Vault. This was like four days ago as we, as we speak. Oh, okay. Okay. No, I know there was another one. No, I, I haven't heard, but tell me about it. There's a lot of these, right? Um, platforms, right? Ones that existed before the ones that are now like speaking, trying to like target the art, artist market directly. Um, but it was just another one. And my point being is just, we've seen the idea of direct to consumer 
like continue to like pick up steam, right? Yeah. Positive yeah. in many ways. Uh, but then they're still just creating a new realm of options and when do I do this or not? And then the other side of that conversation is the anti streaming conversation. And there's this idea of I can just get completely off of streaming, go dark, and I'm only going to be direct to consumer. And there's like hybrid models. We'd love to know like where you fall in that conversation and why. Yeah. So um, I'm not fully anti-streaming by any means, but I kind of I kind of love this in that for those who are are down for it in you have to become your own salesperson. That's my whole thing. Top Music Attorney is about helping people to learn how to get their music to six figures annually. And in order to do that, you think like a record label and sell like a rock star. You don't have to become a label, but you think like a label, right? So as we're thinking of ourselves as labels, we want to monetize our music. And so when we're like just getting really hung up on the fraction of cents that we're getting paid or not paid, <laughs> you know, by Spotify, what else are we thinking about, right? What are we doing this year to merchandise, right? To do short runs of orders. Uh, what are we doing as far as our website? If I want to go hire you right now and you're a music producer, can I go to your website? Is there a resume there? Is there samples of your music? Do you have rates specified? Uh, you know, collaboration, scoring, like all this stuff to really think of yourself as a real music business. So going back to your question, for me, it's not so much like anti-streaming, it's more just diversifying how you're making money and understanding that having one revenue source isn't good for any business, particularly in the music business. If and if you're just focusing on streaming, where I think we could have some fun is we just say, you know, streaming platforms can be utilized for marketing purposes, you know? And so, so for the marketing purposes of, you know, putting out a single, but then you push people to your website to buy your album. And then, yeah. you know, for example, also making sure your music is on social media. Like, man, audience building for everything that you do as any kind of brand for your YouTube channel. Like, you need to be hustling everywhere, making sure everyone knows about you. And so that's, you know, again, audience building, audience harvesting. And so I think I just kind of I'm, I'm somewhere in, in between for, you know, my next record. I kind of like the idea of maybe dropping a couple singles. Those go on the music platforms as marketing i'm not expecting you to make money from that but then for like the legit fans be like hey if you want to support me come get the album let me download it buy a cd buy a vinyl where do, where do you fall on 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 that conversation well exactly what you just said i mean the beauty of music is you know you have this one product and it can be monetized multiple ways and i think what the education curve is for a lot of artists is they don't realize direct to consumer streaming or not, right? Before streaming was even a thing, music always had a different value in different marketplaces, right? Selling on a CD was one specific value. The amount of money that you got from your royalties, right? The, on, on the radio and, and those types of royalties, a different thing, right? A sync could be a different valuation. And then a sync outside of like movies, when you go to like a corporate company that doesn't really think about the music industry, those numbers could be even higher. And so it's really about the buyer, right? Or the medium that the music is being served through. That's always something unique about music. Probably this uh, something similar for like, you know, other media content, but I don't really know that as much about mo me, uh, movies and TV shows and things like that. But that's always been a thing anyway. So using streaming where, yeah, you might make some money right um, from it, but looking at it as more as the marketing at the top of the funnel is right in line with that concept because the artists who have fans eventually will realize, right, as they try more of this, fans who are going to support you are not going to support you right, just because you have something on streaming platforms. They're going to support you because they want to support you. They don't buy because you took it away from them off of another platform in most cases. That's not the relationship um, that's built. That might work for like a, some other form of digital marketer, but it doesn't hit in most cases quite the same for an artist to repeat that um, consistently if they're still trying to grow and bring in new people. If you're just locked in and yeah. you want a smaller size of an audience, um, and and aren't as focused on growing it, then you know 
all all you know um luck to you and best to you because that can work in its own way but yeah i i think the hybrid is the best of all worlds in my opinion yeah and i want yeah. to add to that too because i think where a lot of the the current issues come from is you know I think streaming has kind of spoiled artists in a sense. And like, this is probably one of the first times in music, at least as far as I know, where it's, it, it can be the information in terms of like what's being paid out is a little bit more common than I would assume it was in like, you know, past music years. And you can, I mean, sometimes you can even like do your own hard math. You can go look at a, a artist Spotify and, and rough calculate like what they put together. So I think it's caused a lot of artists a, a lot of artists seem to feel like this new model of building out multiple streams of income off of the music is like oh it's, it's a it's a it's a um sign that like the industry's falling off and music is in value but like shouldn't i say it's like no like there's multiple streams of income from the one source has always been apparent in music you just got so caught up in streaming because you know since 2017 2018 well, however long ago it was streaming got, kind of got like pushed as this big saving grace and not even really by the industry, really by the artists. You know what I'm saying? Like artists kind of started to do it like that. And they, I feel like they set themselves up for disappointment. Like we put so much stock in this one thing and kind of disregarded everything else. That now when it's coming back around that we need to be doing these other things, it feels like a personal attack on this thing that I've been trying to build up for the last couple of years. You know, but like no one told artists to stop doing all the other stuff. You know what I'm saying? On top of that. But I think that's what uh, the, the market kind of like carried to. Oh, hell yeah. No, and I and I love that you said that. And and I love that you guys also mentioned sync licensing. I mean, it's just like I'm I'm I talk about it not only so frequently, but it's become like my I don't know. It's something that I'm I'm really focusing on. I even uh, just launched a course about it. Like I'm so passionate about trying to help people with this because I have clients who make six fig like multiple six figures every year just from sync licensing because they just figure it out. Like if you make the thing. Like you you have now an asset. That asset is your song. And your song has copyright protection in it as soon as you make it. So it's very valuable. It's not just like, oh, now I'm going to put on a you know, streaming platform and I hope I get like a thousand plays. What's that going to do? If we can go and take that song and we put it in a TV show, a game, you know, in, in a synchronization and get you like 5,000 bucks. And so because people aren't thinking like that, they're thinking about the pennies and they're not thinking about the one placements of 500 bucks, 5,000 bucks. And then all of a sudden now you get to those six figures a lot easier. And, you know, sync, sync licensing is an effort just like anything else. Like if you want to be a big star on Instagram, you have to get good at marketing yourself. So it's like, here's a little category of like your efforts as a music marketer for yourself. Here's your category for like sync licensing. Here's your category for like, you know, merchandising. And all of these things have to be worked on and everyone's different. You know, I've, I interviewed um, one of the owners of Fixed Records and they focus on sync licensing. Like they don't put their, their artists on tour. <laughs> they don't care about touring. They don't care about music videos. They're like, that's stupid. We're wasting money. They're like, we do sync. And so everyone can be different and you find your own path. But I'm like, don't untap, like, make sure you tap everything and figure out what's going to make money. What are you passionate about? Because a part of this is like, use your skills. If you're a talented music producer, let people hire you. If you're a talented singer, you know what I'm saying? Like, do at least what you love and make money from it. It doesn't just have to be your one project and your one song. And if it doesn't hit, you're like, ah, oh, I'm giving up. No. You know, I personally think that's probably one of the most beautiful things about the current music industry is that, you know, it, it's one of the first times in a long time where it seems like there genuinely isn't a blueprint, right? It's like, you know, like, I mean, we still on our side, we have artists that have taken the traditional route and be become successful. We have artists that sell courses, they sell services, they build side businesses up the music, they, they jump in the scene. And I almost think like as inspiring as that can be to a lot of artists, I also think it's very intimidating because what's that saying to the artists is like, hey, there's no longer a blueprint. Like if you, you know, if you were artist in the, in the 2000s and you fill out the beat and path, it's very easy to kind of be like, okay, well, you know, that's, that's maybe not completely your fault. Maybe the system that works for you, you didn't understand the system. But now in the world where it's like, there's no real right or wrong answers. So I can't truly tell you like what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. I think it's very intimidating to artists. So, you know, I'm, I'm just curious to hear even from, um, you know, the, the artist side of your brain, like, how do you figure out 
where it makes the most sense to put your energy into, you know, for for building your credit, your credit, uh, creative endeavors. You know, like how you kind of discern between the paths that are going to get you to where you want to go and the time frame you kind of have set for yourself and ones that you may need to come back to at a, at a different point in time in your career. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And when you know, I <laughs> what kind of inspired you know again, like Tom music attorney, and even when I you know started started to actually do like the courses on like the kids who just want to like throw in and do the hard learning and all the stuff. I go however you go about this to help yourself, it's all from how much time and money I wasted that has borne what this is right now. So just meaning I probably spent something like $200,000, like wasted $200,000 on just trying stuff throughout many, many years of, you know, buying onto shows or hiring PR companies or hiring music marketing, this and that, and just wasting money and wasting time. And a big part of where the shift happened for me was what I was, you know, mentioning. I'm like, when you learn to think like a label. Now, I did actually start my own label, but I built an enterprise around myself. And it wasn't because I wanted to sign other artists or do anything like that. It's just because I wanted to take myself seriously. And that's what it took. And so that's why it's been helpful for other people who have that mindset shift. And they go, <clears throat> I can figure this out for myself and what makes the most sense, but I have to kind of go into that setting up. I have to learn about the music business. And then I need to make sure I have like contract templates, right? Would you would you say it's fair to say that maybe a lot of the artists you work with probably do like handshake deals, not really doing contracts? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't even think. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, so there's different tiers of this. So I come in, I'm like, can we at least get a baseline here? Like you need to have, there's like eight, you know, contracts you normally see over and over and over and over. And then when it gets to like your music marketing, what are we doing to always be bringing eyes to? Because I'm like, if you're going to go and hire a PR company and you're like, I just want to be in some magazines, that's cool. What, for someone to see like 100 people to see you in a magazine versus paying like, I don't know, 50 bucks to have 5,000 people see you on Facebook. And so just more being smart with your time and your money and your and, and actually setting goals. And so, you know, I was talking to an artist the other day and he, you know, I was like, so tell me, like, if everything went, you know, goes great this year, how many songs are you going to release? Just a simple question, just to like see where he's at. He's like, yeah, you know, I think I think I could release like uh, like three songs. I'm like, that's cool. Like, I'm, I'm glad. That's good. It's good to have a goal. But like that goal down is so down here. Why isn't it like I need to have my full record done? I want to have like seven shows that I did. I'm doing a collab. Like, think bigger. And so that's, I, you know, it's, it's not so much of like an exact, what's the one thing that I should do? It's more of how are you thinking about your project right now? And do you take it seriously? Or are you just telling yourself that like, no, nah, it's never going to really hit. Like, this is a hobby. And I know so many people like this. I love to get in the studio. I'd love to, you know, work on beats, but I've like never released anything. <laughs> yep. And so it's just kind of like doing an audit of yourself of where you're at right now. And what are your goals? And if your goal is that you want to make this thing like a real full-time gig, you have to act like it. Because if, if you and I were starting, you know, all three of us, we're going to start a cupcake business. <laughs> and we're like, and you know, like we have to sit down and be like, all right, so like, what, what are they going to taste like? What are the flavors? Where's, where's the location? Are we going to have more than one location? There's so much that we have to discuss about. And then we have to talk about the name and the ownership. We have to have the contracts. So why can't artists do the same? And they have to. If you want to be successful in this business, you have to. Well, 100%. Well, 100%. I mean, I just love this conversation of the options and finding your path because I can't say it's a mouse, so I'm going to say it again. <laughs> um, artists promote the idea of independent today, heavily, right? Everybody loves that idea, it seems like. Nobody, you know, rejects that. But independent means you're not going to have a label. With that being said, why do most artists still try to play the labels game? So you're playing the same game, but you're playing it handicapped because they're viewing the game still. OK, I need to get as many streams as possible. What are my first week numbers? Uh, am I going to go on tour and can I get in these big publications or get this cultural clout? All right. That's pretty much the package. And people aren't seeing beyond that. And I think there's a conflict that people are having internally, to be honest. And maybe you can speak to this. And if you ever even went through it, because one, they're not seeing that you could just do sync, right? The most magical 
thing in music to me because you're getting paid for your marketing and could legitimately blow up off of your music being marketed and you got paid for it, right? Um, or you could just perform or you could just just uh, just write or you could drop your music to a select amount of people and you have these private events and make a decent amount of money like that. There's all these different options uh, and paths. Um, but what I think it comes down to is those paths, those new options don't add up. They don't equate to the dream that people had when they were growing up and thinking about becoming an artist. And I think that's what a, a lot of the issue is. You were sold this vision of what it looked like to be an artist. You bought into this and you decided that's what you wanted to be. And when you hear about these other things, although you could be free or right and create the music you want to create, have a legitimate even fan base if you wanted to go that route and focus on fans, but it just doesn't add up if I don't have the billboard number one or if I'm not like schmucking it up with Beyonce at the end of this road or something. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's what a lot of it comes down to. But like, I would love to know your thoughts on that. Oh, you hit so many good things. It's okay. First of all, you said option overload, right? So, you know, even in the, the, the cupcake business scenario, it's like, well, what flavors should we do? You know, fun Halloween stuff. It's almost Halloween or should we just keep it plain? And what should go on the, you know, the window outside. And there's so many ways that we could do this. We could do a quick run and a discount. And when you have so much option overload in the music business of, you know, heaven forbid, you, you come up with a huge list and you're like, wow, I could make money because I could do sample packs. I could sell my services as a music producer. I even know about music marketing because I've learned how to market myself. So I could do packages for that. And you're like, to your point, maybe there's some of that stuff you don't want to do because you go, my, my dream was that someone was just going to like find me and discover me and pay me lots of money. And I would just do stuff when I wanted to do it. And I'd be hanging out with Beyonce. And I mean, if we're being honest with ourselves, like that's probably what a lot of us creatively think <laughs> and want. But A, you know, and, and where I can at least speak from personal experience on this, um, the identity piece is important. It has to shift. It has to shift because the more that you learn and you're like, hey, I can actually help people. I don't know, by starting a YouTube channel. Maybe at some point that wasn't part of the plan. Maybe a podcast at some point wasn't part of the plan, but then you started to see why I'm actually helping people. And maybe someone wants to sponsor you to be on your podcast. And I can make a little bit of money from that. And you're like, okay, well, I never thought I was going to be the, the podcast guy taking sponsorships, but cool. Thanks, money. But that 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 also creates this existential crisis of like, is that what you wanted? Right? And so where I can at least talk about this is becoming an attorney. So I went to law school. I had no intention to become an attorney. I just wanted to learn how to think like a lawyer, learn how to protect myself. And I remember when I was starting law school, I was just like freaked out because I go, I just am so scared it's going to change me. Because the worst thing I could possibly think of is being an attorney. And then I actually did get out of law school and I was like, well, you know, it'd be silly for me not to take the bar. <laughs> I might as well just sit for it. And I sat for it. And I passed it. And then some of my friends needed help. I was like, Ugh, all right. So, so I might as well just start like a law firm and just kind of help them and this and that because, you know, I can. And then it just started to grow and evolve. And I really had to go through this identity shift because through it all, I never stopped doing music. I just started to become a legit attorney. My law firm started to grow and we've represented people all around the United States and all this stuff. And it's amazing. Like it's it's brought so many opportunities that I never would have gotten as, you know, a dark pop artist. And that's OK. And but I but that's internal stuff that I just have to deal with on who I've become because I just allowed myself to do things that I know and to grow. And so just for anyone who's maybe having a little bit of that, you know, that crisis listening to this in that. You want to go full towards your dreams. That does require sometimes that you grow in different ways. And and it's a good thing. It's scary and it's uncomfortable. I think that for everything that, you know, anyone, any either of us or any of us on this call, like anything that meaningful that you've done in your life was probably really scary. And you had to, you had to get uncomfortable to do that. Do you think that artists actually limit themselves from a humanity standpoint, right? Like there's still this idea that many artists don't seem to be able to cope with the idea that you also could be really good at business or 
or, or marketing at the same time or have these other facets of yourself, right? Like they, they make it seem that you have to be this, um, this limited individual tunnel, tunnel, vi tunnel vision individual, almost, uh, somebody who will reach up of oh, that interview isn't out yet. Uh, <laughs> this is bogus again. <laughs> this he keeps popping up because I looked at it today, pulling clips. But uh, he he is, this is the artist, and he says that artists get encouraged to be to be an idiot savant, mm -hmm. right? Great at, at art, at, at art, but not so great at these other things. And do you think maybe like it's just limiting it in general, where maybe the idea is just saying, "Hey, I can be this." And that this doesn't make me worse of an artist if that's what you're afraid of to be a good business person, uh, I don't know, parent, uh, you know, marketer or all, whatever all these other boxes are. That's what it seems like. What do you think about that? Yeah, we'll even go deeper than that. Why? So let's just take that as true, right? Let's take it as true as we are limiting ourselves because you know an ideal has been placed on us even by ourselves and we're like no i'm supposed to be this thing this other thing doesn't fit within that messaging and so therefore i don't want to do it even if maybe it ends up helping or whatever <clears throat> and we do limit ourselves because of that but if you go deeper why why would we limit ourselves in that kind of way why would i be like oh i don't want to be an attorney that's terrible because i have an idea about it because it's based in fear mm. and i think that we all need to as human beings we need to kind of address that you know, and again, why we don't get uncomfortable, why sometimes we never go after our dreams and why we'll just regret it forever, because it's better to fail than to not try it at all. Right. But I think it comes from our, our deep insecurities about being judged. And that's just like the baseline of being like an artist and a producer and a musician. Because if, if I'm here saying, hey, here's your five tips on you know music marketing, here's stuff that works for me and I have all these followers now, blah, 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 blah. The reason why you're not going to go do that for a lot of people is because you don't want to put yourself out there. You don't want to be judged. You want to you don't want to read mean comments. And that's all totally understandable. But going back to what you're saying on like, you know, are we limiting ourselves in that I could actually be an incredible business person and I've never even just thought of myself like that? Yeah, I think that what that's what most people are doing, in fact. And that's why they're stuck. Yeah, I don't think artists, when they're thinking about themselves in that box, they realize that this is just a human thing that many people are going through anyway, right? Like you said, like people just box themselves in for a lot of reasons, a lot of different limiting beliefs. And even the content thing, we had a conversation where um, an artist commented under one of the videos and be like, well, y'all wouldn't ask a chef to create content, yeah, right? Yeah. And it's like, well, no, if you look at uh, Gordon Ramsay or like just any of these businesses, you know, artists aren't the only ones who complain that they have to do social media now, right? <laughs> There's a lot of like businesses that are now having to do social media and are losing business to businesses who are not as good as them, but they have social media presences. Like this is just the way of the world. And sometimes like isolating it to just your own experience, sometimes it's good, but then sometimes it's counterproductive because you're harder on your own existence and it also might cause you to not evolve with just realizing it's the times not a specific effort against you you know mm -hmm. yeah on the on the content thing I, I especially if someone says something like that to me i'm like are you kidding me like i literally have three brands i have miss crystal which is my music stuff i have top music attorney which is to help music creators and then i have my law firm delgado entertainment law and we're releasing like 30 pieces of content a day. And so trust me, I have the same neurotic thoughts about, you know, I can't do this or it's to this or it's to that or whatever. But I have to get through that myself. And I'm doing boring lawyer content <laughs> and making it interesting and making it fun. OK, so if I can do that for the boring lawyer stuff, you can do it for your great fun music. Yeah, I never thought of like that. Whatever, great. <laughs> <laughs> that simple because you're already supposed to love it you're already supposed to be enjoying it yeah. Yeah. yeah but it doesn't it doesn't make it easier you know and i share this with people i go you know i, I didn't start taking social media seriously till like 2018 which was way the hell late you know into my music career and i was like just because you know i'm like ah it's so stupid sitting there and taking vanity pictures you know in the car and finding one out of 200 because your face looks weird any other way like it feels terrible because of all your internal talk 
But I'm like, at some point, like that's never going to go away to, to a degree. It really never goes away. And so you need to, as a music business owner, which is how you need to think of yourself or a record label owner, however you're going to put it. I know you guys have, have different branding on that, but, but either way that you are now executing and you're like, it doesn't even matter how I feel about it, because all I'm going to do is I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to see how the market responds. So if you're like, I'm going to try something new on the channel or whatever, your feelings or your guys is, you know, arguing about what's going to be good or not good literally doesn't matter. What matters is how it performs. And then you have a conversation about it. And so that's how you need to treat the music stuff as well. Like try everything. And even going back to like the option overload, that's good. If you're not sure, that means you need to try more stuff. Yeah, just taste. Look at it a lot more as a a discovery process versus being so eager to like grow and find success. I think that's probably a part of it, right? Like just taste all these things like you like you said and, you know, maybe give yourself if I'm just getting in this, into the game. A year or so, I think most artists, maybe it's because of what you're seeing when people go viral and things like that. I mean, I know so many artists who come to me and it's like, I haven't even dropped my first track, but I'm already thinking I need to have X amount of fans in six months and potentially be monetizing in six months. And it's like, whoa, this is, I don't think you understand how this goes, right? This, uh, it would be nice. It would be very much, it would be nice, but you probably shouldn't invest in and look at the game that way. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, the whole I'm going to give this a year thing. Then you're not. I mean, you're not. I'm not saying you're not a real artist, but like for me, music is like an addiction. You mm. know what I'm saying? Like I've built a lot from NPS with all my social media stuff. Even when I didn't want to do it, I still did it. And I brought in millions of dollars through my law firm, never advertising once, mm. but because I made it a commitment. You don't want to do it. You just get your ass and make bulk content and you put it out and you do YouTube videos if you need to, you do Instagram videos if you need to, like you just do it because it's part of your job because you want it to be successful. And you have to have that same mentality when it comes to music as well. I forgot where I was going with that, but I'm just go going back to it because I'm just passionate. It's like you, you just show up for yourself. No one knows your brand better than you. No one cares about your career more than you. So stop waiting for someone to give you permission. I'm giving you permission right now. Like get to work. I love that so much because to me, you basically said, I can't not do music. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. No, and so comparatively, but it's like, I'm still, you know, I'm always fighting back the success of anything else that I'm doing with, I just, I'm trying to make music. I'm trying not to be hoarse from like yelling at stupid tune core all day. Like, I just, you know what I'm saying? So I just know what I want for my life. And I'm making space for it and just figuring it out. And no one's special. We all have the same challenges in different ways. Well, I guess to, to close it out, can you speak just more from a general standpoint of how you see yourself moving in, in, in your career, maybe over the next couple of years? I know you said you want to do a hybrid approach on your next release, but you know, I would love to know where you see your personal career going. Yeah, so, you know, uh, my show producer, also my music producer, you know, we're looking at starting, you know, starting a side project. I'm working on my next album. And so it's just kind of, you know, figuring out as I'm, as I've gotten really close with my fans, if it makes sense of like, figuring out kind of works for them. And being centric with your audience is very important. And going back to the social media stuff, right? If you put your audience first, it clarifies everything a lot. Because now it's not about you. It's not about how you feel about it and your insecurities. You go, what can I do to like make my audience laugh today? What can I do to teach them something? What can I do to share something with them? And if you think about them all the time when you are making content, it makes it just a lot easier. But then that's the whole point of everything we're doing. We're like, ah, go hire, you know, a marketing agency to get you that interview. Why? So you can be in front of more people and make more fans. So if the whole point of all of this is that you're putting out music to connect with people who might buy your merch and come to your shows and support your stuff, like make them a priority. And so for me and what I'm doing, you know, a lot of my objectives is really just with that end goal. It's like always, be, you know, challenging myself creatively, trying to grow my skill set, try to be a better singer, try to be a better producer, try to like learn more and in the instruments that I play. You know, so that's my selfish stuff. Why I want to do it. it makes me feel really good. Make great music videos, work with creative people. Like, I'm very obsessed with the process. And I've said this my entire career. I'm like, I'm going to be dead one day. 
and like it's cool people will remember my music for a while but what matters to me are those two things that i enjoyed the experience and that hopefully i touched some people that cared about my music while i was here love the art well i'm glad perfect way to end it yo everybody this is yeah another episode of no labels necessary podcast i'm brian and sean and i'm coerced we yep. out peace Appreciate you for watching. If you like content like this, you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com. And the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on YouTube. We get straight to the information. There's play by play and courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members, and it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com.